St. Peter then continued, quote, The servant of Christ, our dearest brother Andrew, will follow his master, preaching his faith in the Scythian provinces of Europe, Epirus, and Thrace, and from the city of Patras in Achaia. He will govern all that province and the others of his lot as far as possible. The servant of Christ, our dearest brother James the Greater, will follow his master, preaching the faith in Judea, in Samaria, and in Spain. Thence he shall return in order to preach the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ in this city of Jerusalem. The most dear brother John shall obey the will of our Savior and Master, as it made known to him from the cross, discharging the duties of a son toward our great mother and mistress. He shall serve her and assist her with filial reverence and fidelity. He shall administer to her the sacred mysteries of the Eucharist, and shall also take care of the faithful in Jerusalem during our absence. And when our God and Redeemer shall have taken his, into heaven his most blessed mother, he shall follow his master in the preaching of the faith in Asia Minor, governing the churches there established from the island of Patmos, whither he shall retire on account of persecution. The servant of Christ, our dearest brother Thomas, will follow his master preaching in India, in Persia, and among the Parthians, Medes, Hyrcanians, Brahmins, Bactrians. He shall baptize the three Magi kings, and as they shall be attracted by the rumor of his preaching and his miracles, he shall instruct them fully in all things according to their expectations. The servant of Christ, our dearest brother James, shall follow his master in his office of pastor and bishop of Jerusalem, where he shall preach to all the Jews and shall assist John in the attendance and service of the great mother of our Savior. The servant of Christ, our dearest brother Philip, shall follow his master, preaching and teaching in the provinces of Phrygia and Scythia of Asia, and in the city called Hierapolis in Phrygia. The servant of Christ, our dearest brother Bartholomew, shall follow his master, preaching in Lyconia, part of Cappadocia in Asia, and he shall go to further India, and afterwards to Armenia Minor. The servant of Christ, our dearest brother Matthew, shall first, first teach the Hebrews, and then shall follow his master, preaching in Egypt and Ethiopia. The servant of Christ, our dearest brother Simon, shall follow his master, preaching in Babylon, Persia, and also in the kingdom of Ethiopia. The servant of Christ, our dearest brother Judas Thaddeus, shall follow our master, preaching in Mesopotamia, and afterwards shall join, shall join Simon to preach in Babylon and in Persia. The servant of Christ, our dearest brother Matthias, shall follow our master, preaching his holy faith in the interior of Ethiopia and in Arabia, and afterwards he shall return to Palestine. And may the Spirit of God accompany us all, govern and assist us, so that in all places we fulfill his holy and perfect will, and may he give us his benediction, in whose name I now give it to all. Unquote. These were the words of St. Peter. When he ceased speaking, a loud thunder was heard, and the cynical was filled with splendor and refulgence in witness of the presence of the Holy Ghost. From the midst of this splendor was heard a sweet and soft voice saying, Let each one accept his allotment. They prostrated themselves upon the ground, and with one voice said, quote, Most High Lord, thy word and the word of thy vicar we obey with a prompt and joyous heart. And our souls rejoice and are filled with thy sweetness in the abundance of thy wonderful works. Unquote. This entire and ready obedience of the apostles to the vicar of Christ, our Savior, since it was the effect of their ardent and loving desire to die for his holy faith, disposed them on that occasion for the grace of once more receiving the Holy Ghost, who confirmed and augmented the favors they, they had already received. They were filled with a new light and knowledge concerning the peoples and provinces assigned to them by St. Peter, and each one recognized the conditions, nature, and customs of the kingdom singled out for him, being furnished interiorly with the most distinct and abundant information concerning each. The Most High gave them new fortitude to encounter labors, agility for overcoming distances, although in this regard they were afterwards to be frequently assisted by the holy angels, and the fire of divine love so that they became inflamed like seraphim lifted far beyond the condition and sphere of mere human creatures. 
the most blessed queen was present at all these events and the workings of the divine power in the apostles and in herself were very clear to her for on this occasion she experienced more of the divine influences than all of them together as she was exalted super eminently above all creatures so the increase of her gifts was in like proportion transcending immeasurably those of others the most high renewed in the purest spirit of his mother the infused knowledge concerning all creatures and especially concerning the kingdoms and nations assigned to the apostles she knew all that each one knew and more than they all together because she received a personal and individual knowledge of each person to whom the faith of christ was to be preached and she was made relatively just as familiar with all the earth and its inhabitants as she was with her oratory and all those that entered therein wow. as i have said above and shall often repeat farther on the knowledge of mary was the knowledge of a supreme mistress mother governess and sovereign of the church which the almighty had placed in her hands she was to take care of all from the highest to the lowest of the saints and also of the sinners as the children of eve as no one was to receive any blessing or favor from the hands of her son except through that of his mother it was necessary that this most faithful faithful dispen i'm sorry that this most faithful dispensatrix of grace should know all of her family whom she was to guard as a mother and such a mother the great lady therefore had not only infused images and knowledge of all this but she actually experienced it according as the disciples and apostles proceeded in their work of preaching before her lay open all their labors and dangers and the attacks of the demons against them the petitions and prayers of these and of all the faithful so that she might be able to support them with her own or aid them through her angels or by herself in person for in all these different ways did she render her assistance as we shall see in many events yet to be described I wish merely to state here that besides the knowledge derived by our queen from infused images, she had also in God himself another knowledge of things through her abstracted vision, by which she continually saw the divinity. But there was a difference between these two different kinds of knowledge, since when she saw God in the labors of the apostles and of all the faithful, saw in God the labors of the apostles and of all the faithful of the church, enjoying at the same time through this vision a certain participation of the eternal beatitude the most loving mother was not affected with the sensible sorrow and compassion which filled her when perceiving these tribulations themselves through images in this latter kind of vision she felt and bewailed them with maternal compassion in order that this merit might not be wanting in her the Lord conferred this second kind of knowledge upon her for all the time of her pilgrimage here below. Joined with this plenitude of infused species and knowledge, she held also absolute command of her faculties, as I have said above, so that she admitted no images or ideas except those that were absolutely necessary for sustaining life or for some work of charity or perfection. With this adornment and beauty, which was patent to the angels and saints, the heavenly lady was an object of admiration, inducing them to praise and glorify the Most High for the worthy exercise of all his attributes in Mary, his most holy instrument. On this occasion, she offered a most profound prayer for the perseverance and courage of the apostles in their preaching throughout the world, and the Lord promised her that he would guard and assist them to manifest the glory of his name, and that he would at the end worthily reward them for their labors and merits. By this promise, Most Holy Mary was filled with grateful jubilee, and she exhorted the apostles to give themselves up to this work with all their heart, to set out joyfully and confidently for the conversion of the world. Speaking to them many other words of sweetness in life, she congratulated them on her knees in the name of her divine Son for the obedience they had shown, and in her own name she thanked them for the zeal they had manifested for the honor of the Lord and for the blessings they had brought to souls by their sacrifice. She kissed the hands of each apostle, offering her prayers and her services, and asking them for their blessing, which they, as priests of God, gave her. A few days after the partition of the earth among the apostles, they began to leave Jerusalem, especially those that were allotted the provinces of Palestine, and first among them was St. James the Greater. Others stayed longer in Jerusalem, because the Lord wished the faith to be preached there more abundantly 
and the Jews to be called before all others if they chose to come and accept the invitation to the marriage feast of the gospel. For in the blessing of the redemption, this people, although more ungrateful than the heathens, was especially favored. Afterwards, all the apostles gradually departed for the regions assigned to them, according as time and season demanded, and as obedience to the divine spirit, the counsel of the most holy Mary, and the order of St. Peter dictated. But before leaving Jerusalem, each one visited the holy places, such as the garden, Calvary, the holy sepulchre, the place of the ascension, Bethany, and the other memorable spots as far as possible. All of them showed their veneration, moved even to tears, and regarding with loving wonder the very earth which the Savior had touched. Then they visited the cynical, reverencing the spot where so many mysteries had taken place. There, again commanding themselves to commending themselves to her protection, they took leave of the great Queen of Heaven. The Blessed Mother dismissed them with words full of sweetness and divine virtue. But admirable was the solicitude and care of the most prudent lady in showing herself as the true mother of the apostles at their departure. For each of the twelve she made a woven tunic similar to that of Christ our Savior, of a color between brown and ash gray, and in order to weave these garments she called to aid her holy angels. She furnished, furnished each of the apostles' garments of the same kind and like to that formerly worn by their master Jesus, for she wished that they should imitate him even in their garments, and thereby be known exteriorly as his disciples. The great lady procured also twelve crosses of the height and size of each of the apostles and gave one to each, so that, as a witness of their doctrine and for their consolation, they might carry it along in their wanderings and their preaching. Each of the apostles preserved and carried this cross with them to his death, and as they were so loud in praise of the cross, some of the tyrants made use of this very instrument to torment them happily to death. Moreover, the devout mother furnished each one of them with a small metal case in which she placed three of the thorns from the crown of her divine son, some pieces of the clothes in which she had wrapped the infant Savior, and of the linen with which she had wiped and caught the most precious blood of the circumcision and passion of the Lord. All these sacred pledges she had preserved with the greatest care and veneration, as the mother and the treasure keeper of heaven. In order to consign them to the apostles, she called them together, and with the majesty of a queen and the tenderness of a mother, she told them that these remembrances with which she would enrich them on her departure, on their departure, were the greatest treasures in her possession, for in them they would carry with them vivid remembrances of her divine Son and the certain assurance that the Lord loved them as his children and as ministers of the Most High. Then she handed them those relics, which they received with tears of consolation and joy. They thanked the great Queen for these favors and prostrated themselves in adoration of the sacred relics. Embracing, they bade farewell to each other, St. James being the first to depart and commence his mission. I was given to understand that the apostles preached not only in the countries assigned to them by St. Peter, but in many other neighboring and more remote regions. This is not difficult to understand, because many times they were carried from one country to another by the angels, not only in order to preach, but in order to consult with each other, especially with the vicar of Christ, St. Peter. <clears throat> and still, much more frequently, were they brought in the presence of their queen, whose sympathy and counsel they needed in the arduous enterprise of planting the faith in so many different and barbarous nations. If, in order to bring nourishment to Daniel, the angel took Habakkuk to Babylon, Daniel 14.35, it is nothing strange that such miracles should be performed for the apostles in order that they might preach Christ, make known the divinity, and plant the universal church for the salvation of the human race. Above I have made mention of the angel who carried Philip, one of the seventy-two disciples, from the road of Gaza to Azotus, as related by St. Luke, Acts 8.40. All these miracles and innumerable others unknown to us were necessary to these men, who were to be sent to so many kingdoms, provinces, and peoples, yet in possession of the devil, full of idolatries, errors, I'm going to restart that sentence. All these miracles and innumerable others unknown to us were necessary to these men who were to be sent to so many kingdoms, provinces, and peoples yet in possession of the devil, 
full of idolatries, errors, and abominations, which was the condition of the world at the time the Incarnate Word came to save the human race. Instruction given to me by the Queen of the Angels. My daughter, by the lessons contained in this chapter, I wish to draw thee to deplore, with inmost groaning and sighing, and if possible with tears of blood, the difference between the state of the Holy Church in our times and that of those primitive times, how its purest gold of holiness has been obscured, and the ancient beauty in which the apostles have founded it is lost, how it has sought foreign and deceitful powers and paints to cover the hoard and distorted ugliness of vice. In order that thou mayest penetrate into this truth, thou must renew in thyself the consideration of the force and eagerness with which the divinity seeks to communicate his goodness and perfection to creatures. So great is the impetus of the river of God's goodness overflowing on mankind, that only the free will of man, which he has given to him in order to receive its benefits, can raise a dam against it. And whenever, through this free will, man resists the influence and force of the divine goodness, he, according to thy mode of understanding, violates and grieves this immense love in its very essence. But if creatures would place no obstacle and permit its operations, the whole soul would be inundated and satiated with participation in its divine essence and attributes. It would raise the fallen from the dust, enrich the indigent children of Adam, place them above all their miseries, and set them, seat them with the princes of his glory. 1 Kings 2, 8 From this, my daughter, thou wilt understand two things unknown to human wisdom. First, how pleasing to the highest goodness is the service of those who with an ardent zeal for God's glory devote their labor and solicitude toward removing the obstacles which men place to their own justification and the communication of his favors. The satisfaction of the Most High arising from this work in others cannot be estimated in this mortal life. On this account, the ministry of the apostles, the prelates, the priests, and preachers of the divine word are so highly exalted, for they succeed in the office for they succeed in office those who founded the church and who labored in its preservation and extension. All of them are to be cooperators and executors of the immense love of God for the souls created to be sharers in his divinity. Secondly, thou must ponder the greatness and abundance of the gifts and favors which the infinite power communicates to those souls who do not hinder his most liberal bounty. The Lord manifested this truth immediately in the beginnings of the evangelical church, when, to all those who were to enter into it, he showed his bounty by such great prodigies and wonders, frequently sending the Holy Ghost in a visible manner, working miracles in those who accepted the creed, and showering forth other hidden favors on the faithful. But most of all, shone forth his almighty power and munificence in the apostles and disciples, because in them there was no hindrance to his eternal and holy will, and they were true instruments and executors of the divine love, imitators and successors of Christ and followers of truth. Hence, they were elevated to an ineffable participation in the attributes of God, especially as regards his science, holiness, and power, working for themselves and for the soul such great miracles as mortal man cannot ever sufficiently extol. After the apostles, other children were born to the church, in which, from generation to generation, this divine wisdom and its effects were transplanted. Psalms 44, 17. Leaving aside at present the innumerable martyrs who shed their blood for Christ and gave their lives for the holy faith, consider the founders of religions, the great saints who flourished in them, the doctors, the bishops, the prelates, and apostolical men through whom the bounty and omnipotence of God was so abundantly manifested. They are so great that others who are ministers of God for the welfare of souls and all the faithful can have no excuse, even if God does not work similar ones in those he finds fit for his operations. And that is where I'm going to stop for this reading. O oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. All glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May God bless and keep you.